Okay, so here we are, Psi243, Cognitive Psychology, Lecture 2. And in this lecture, we're going to be looking at this paper, Human Relational Memory Requires Time and Sleep, uh, which is by uh, Alan Bogan et al. Uh, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Um, so I'm going to assume you've read this paper, and I'm going to walk through uh, my thoughts as I, as I read it again, and... and what I thought about the arguments and the evidence they present. I'm not going to give you uh, a definitive critique by uh, a topic expert. Uh, I'm not uh, a, a memory researcher, so I can't tell you. The critique I'm going to give you is not going to connect to all the other studies that you could read about on this topic um, and uh, counterpoints that could be made about this study. What I want to show you is what a, a professional cognitive scientist thinks as they read through a new paper presenting some new and interesting evidence. Uh, and that uh, relates to the purpose of this course. So what we're trying to do here is develop our critical skills, uh, hone our ability to write a critical analysis of a, a piece of psychological evidence, a, a psychological paper. So what we're trying to do here is not slag off the paper to find every little flaw in it, uh, or even to come up with a final pronouncement on whether it's definitely all right or definitely all wrong. But we're here to uh, weigh the strengths and weaknesses and come up with a, a conclusion that puts these findings, uh, these arguments made based on the findings, in context, that um, tries to say what's good and what's bad and what could be improved about a piece of research. So here we go. Human relational memory requires time and sleep. I chose this paper because I thought it's a really nice example of operationalization. And what I mean by that is taking an idea and coming up with a protocol, an experimental paradigm that captures uh, something important about that idea in something you can measure. So the, the abstract theory is operationalized in a specific measurement. Um, so when I first read the title, as I do with all titles, I, I look at it and I, I think about whether I know what the words mean. Human, time, sleep, I think I understand them. Relational memory, you know, maybe that's a, a term of art that we're not familiar with. They mean that in a specific uh, sense here in the abstract, first thing, we get their definition, the flexible ability to generalize across existing stores of information in memory. So what this paper does is it has a specific method of testing this general and important cognitive uh, ability, relational memory, to take individual items in memory and to generalize across them or find connections between them. And then you can see immediately that that's an important and interesting uh, cognitive ability. Um, so it's always good to, 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 to transverse that, uh, that bridge between the abstract and the specific. So they say that they're testing relational memory, but what are they really doing? What they're really doing is they get people to learn pairs of comparisons. Uh, so uh, object A, uh, if you're shown object A and object B, you should choose object A, and if you're shown object B and object C, you should choose object B. And then they test inferences from those comparisons. So an inference would be that if you're shown A and C, you should choose A, because A is better than B and B is better than C. But I'm still talking at a very general level here, and in the method they, they give it in that A, B, C, D, E, F uh, way. What do they, um, what do they mean? Uh, well, here we can see in blue that they've given the specific, uh, that they're visual patterns, and then these are given in the supporting information. So follow the link, go to the supporting information, and you get to see the, the actual patterns that they use. It's always important when you're looking at a paper, you want to know not just what they claim, but precisely what they did and who they did it with and what stimuli they used. So here we can see our visual patterns are these... Uh, pretty fractal uh, patterns uh, contained in ovals. Um,
And here we have a schematic representation of uh, the protocol. So rather than telling you which patterns, they'd say A, B, C, D, E, F. And obviously they do that because for each individual, which pattern is A and which is B and which is C and so on is varied because they're counterbalancing so that no particular pattern is always B for every, uh, or always A or always B for every subject. Uh, they're trained on the premise pairs. They don't say that here, but later, but they're given uh, feedback on which is right or wrong after each choice, so they learn by trial and error. Um, they are tested at the end of training to show that they've uh, all groups have reached a commensurate level of performance, and then there is different amounts of delay, and it's these different amounts of delay and what happens during the delay that is key to the findings of this paper. So here's uh, figure two showing the, the uh, key results. Um, so what we've got um, is uh, on the left here, we've got performance on the premise pairs. So this is the, the A, uh, A versus B or B versus C. And everyone's doing very well, even after a delay, 90% performance um, on the premise pairs. But what about inference pairs? So these are things that were never directly trained through trial and error there, um, A versus C, or even A versus D, or A versus uh, E. Well, what we have in the um, um, B, B column of this figure is a comparison between the 20-minute group, the group with uh, 12 hours delay between uh, learning and test, and the group with 24 hours delay between learning and test. And what we can see is a massive difference. The group that have uh, 20 minutes delay performing at chance, not statistically distinguishable from chance on these inferences, but the group that has had a delay, so that's the effect of time, are able to make those inferences um, uh, far more successfully and significantly different from chance. Uh, and then here we have in section uh, C of figure 2, they've divided out the inference pairs according to whether they're one degree separated or two degrees separated. So that's, uh, are we testing um, A versus C, uh, where the premise pair would be A and B, A versus B and B versus C. That's a one degree of inference, A versus C. Two degree of inference is obviously um, A versus D. So you've got to combine your knowledge from premise pairs. A is better than B, B is better than C, and C is better than D to uh, come to the correct inference of two degrees of separation. Here uh, in the next figure is um, uh, another crucial comparison they make. So the first figure showed us the effect of sleep. Um, sorry, the first figure showed us the effect of uh, time. So uh, 12 hours and 24 hours uh, created above chance inferences. Here we're looking just at the 12, or we're dividing the 12-hour group into those that got to sleep and those that stayed awake between learning and test. They're um, trained, they do the learning either in the morning or the evening, and then obviously the people who were, do the learning in the evening come back the next morning, 12 hours later, they've gone to sleep, or at least we assume they've gone to sleep, um, and the people who uh, uh, learn in the morning stay awake and are tested in the evening. And what do we see? Well, what we see is that um, um, there is a, uh, for the people who stayed awake, so let's uh, look here. We're looking just at section A. This is before percentage correct, so performance on the memory test. The group that stayed awake um, are performing above chance. We already know that. But the group that um, were tested 12 hours later and had a chance to sleep um, have a selective boost, particularly in the two degree of separation inference pair. So the inferences that are harder to make based on memory um, are selectively enhanced or supported uh, when people have a chance to go to sleep. And you can also see this in the 24 hour group. So the 24 hour group, they have uh, extra delay, but they definitely go to sleep um, and they, um, uh, they're have this boost for the far two degree of separation of performance. This section B in the figure is confidence ratings, which you can see don't really differ. 
So there's a there's a bit in the um, uh, in the text where they explain why they ran this 24 hour group because they say, uh, have I got it here? Uh, one possible explanation for the performance dissociation between wake and sleep might be the difference of time of day when the testing took place. So we look at we think about the 12 hour group. They are either tested in the morning if they've just had a sleep. Um, or they're testing in the evening if they've just been awake for the last 12 hours. So do we know that the difference between that group, the 12-hour sleep and 12-hour wake, is due to the fact that they've been asleep, or due to the fact that one group is tested in the morning and one group is tested in the evening? Could be that um, people are the uh, memory ability equivalent of morning people or evening people, and that generates the effect. Hence the 24-hour group, hour group, because uh, like the 12-hour sleep group, the 24 hour subjects were tested uh, after going to sleep, but they were tested um, in the morning. Sorry, they were tested in the evening, just like the subjects who didn't get to sleep in the 12 hour group. Um, so, this, this control 24 hour group seems a, a bit like an afterthought, and um, I wanted to think a bit harder about the logic of what they're controlling. So I um, made a little Excel table here just to, to sort this out in my head. So we've got three groups. Row two there is the time. Row three, uh, sleep, wake, sleep, is the whether the group um, gets to go to sleep or not. Um, sleep. The row four is the time at which they learn. And row five is the time when they're tested. Um, and we are told that um, the reason for the 24-hour group is that they are tested at the same time as the 12-hour wake group. So the fact that they get the same result as the 12-hour sleep group can't be because of when they're tested. Um, because they're tested at the same time as the 12-hour wake group. So that seems to eliminate the possibility that the effect in this paper is due to time of testing. Making the table made me realise that the effect could be due to time of learning. So it's not impossible to imagine that the time when you learn this material causes it to be stored in memory in a, in a different way. Even though you're performing you know, at the same level, or you're able to answer the questions just as well, the way it's encoded in memory differs depending on whether you learn it in the morning or the evening. And that means that we still can't tell whether the effect, um, the, the difference between the groups is due to the fact that they slept or waked between, test, between training and testing, or whether they were trained in the morning or the evening. Because if you look um, at the two sleep groups, they're both trained in the evening, and the waking group is test is trained in the morning. So uh, a technical way of saying that is the time of learning and uh, the, the, the sleep-wake factor are confounded. So strictly, you still don't know from this uh, experiment uh, which it was. I and mean, it's probably, it is the fact that they got to go to sleep, but you can't be certain of that. What you'd need to do is another experiment where you deconfounded the conditions. So you need a fourth condition where people get to go to, uh, get to stay awake, but are trained in the evening. The problem with that, of course, is that if you train people in the evening and you insist that they stay awake for 12 hours, they're going to be very tired, and then you're going to have an effect of fatigue on your results, which will stop you drawing strong conclusions. So there, there are ways around this, and people have tried to get around it, um, Kirsten tells me. Uh, but within this paper, there is still this potential confound. Um... Another thing I thought about when reading this paper is this um, uh, this uh, measure, this this uh, claim about awareness. Um, so uh, people seem uh, the subjects in different groups are equally confident 
about their answers. It's just they don't have strong insight into how right or wrong they are. Um, but we still, uh, this is the only um, sort of meta memory measure taken uh, in the study. We don't know uh, whether the subjects were explicitly rehearsing um, their, the premise pairs or thinking about them during the delay. We don't know what they were doing. So there's a sort of, again, a kind of question of mechanism about is it really just the fact that they went to sleep or was it that they did think or that they're going to sleep or allowed them to not think about the original premise pairs or that it, how they, they, you know, had time to reflect on the experiment as they were going off to sleep or whatever it was. We don't really know. So let's just re revise that uh, key result again. So uh, having a delay between learning something and testing seems to boost your ability to make inferences, this relational memory, to draw connections that are not directly taught but are latent in the structure of the material you've learned. So you can immediately see the relevance to anyone who studies or, or wants to have ideas there. This uh, boost uh, seems to come about with uh, a delay, 12 hours versus uh, 20 minutes. Uh, if we uh, look at the first figure, this figure we're looking at here shows that the particular um, kind of inference, let's call them far inferences or remote inferences, these are the two degrees of separation inferences, are selectively boosted if you get to go to sleep as well as having a delay. So your waking day, if you, lear you learn in the morning or test in the evening with no sleep, doesn't seem to have the effect on memory that the same amount of time, but time spent in a different brain state, uh, does. Um, so I talked a bit about um, uh, worries about whether the 24-hour group is, a, is an adequate control for time of learning as well as time of testing. Um, I've talked about us not really being clear about uh, what people are doing so we know that they're awake or asleep but all, what are they cognitively, what's going on, are they explicitly rehearsing or are they being deliberately distracted, what's the mechanism of action of this effect. Um, but, but all in all this is a, this is a pretty uh, striking result it looks and uh, um, uh, which seems to produce a, a large effect on the, uh, the the thing that's measured. One small concern I had was that there seems to be a bit of a the statistics are a bit of a mess. So they, they they've done this twenty four hour group seemingly an after as an afterthought. They've done a bunch of t tests when really they should be doing one and over. There are different numbers of people in the two sleep conditions. So it um. Reading this, you you wonder if they had a plan for how they were going to analyse this before they started collecting the data. Did they know they were going to analyse the one degree separated and the two degree um, separated uh, inferences, or did they find a pattern in the data and then report that uh, post hoc? So it's probably reliable, but I think I'd you know deduct a couple of marks for um, them not. Uh, appearing to follow a consistent analysis strategy. Uh, so none, none of the criticisms I've got of this paper are definitive. All of them uh, would need following up. You could look at subsequent work by these authors or uh, people they work with and you'd probably find that it agrees with um, a lot of the other work in the literature. Um, also interesting uh, for me, of course, is the Sort of implications. Here's a link to an article I wrote um, uh, on this paper for the BBC, which uh, has been given the title "How Sleep Makes Your Mind More Creative." So this ability to make remote inferences, to connect items that you have in memory, but um, can but to see connections that aren't immediately apparent, um, you know, obviously is something that we rely upon to come to sudden realizations, insights into material we know. Um, it seems to be part of, or it seems in kind of superficially to be part of that process that happens where you move beyond just 
uh, learning or being able to uh, express some material that you've learned, but really to understand it and connect it to everything else um, uh, in, in, that you know, uh, which is a, a process called consolidation. Um, so uh, the moral is, is probably pretty clear. I mean, in this, in this article I say, try doing creative work when you've just woken up because you're in a brain state which is, which is uh, uh, fruitful for making connections. Um, the other implication is that if you really want to understand material that you've learned, you need to make sure you get enough sleep. Okay, thank you very much.